fun seekers who've come to the right place. <laughs> this is the Cartoon Voices panel, so I must be Mark Evanier. And these must be five of the best cartoon voice <laughs> actors working in the business today, because that's the only kind we let on this panel. <laughs> Remain anonymous throughout this panel yeah. is Mr. Joe Oakman, ladies and gentlemen. Joe, demonstrate one character voice of yours for us. Well, let's see now. I could be um, uh, Professor Heron McDougall from Red Dead Redemption. Mr. Marston, Mr. Marston, please help me. The zombies are coming. <laughs> On. Is this microphone on? Can you hear him in the back? I can get it. My microphone on. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. Who's next on the Oh, and we have Miss Cynthia McWilliams. <laughs> Cynthia, would you demonstrate one voice of yours for us now? Oh, I love how you guys put people on the spot out here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a spicy cat who likes to have some fun. That's me, it's Cheetah from Justice League Revelations. And this is one of the newer people in our business who is suddenly stopping up all the jobs, some of which, some of which he can't tell you about. This is Mr. Brian Hull, ladies and gentlemen. Caitlin Robrock. <laughs> well, I love having Caitlin on the panel, or Kate as we like to call her, is that she used to come to these panels back before she was in the business. She was usually in the first row or the second row. For all my people right here. <laughs> and, and now she is on this panel. Caitlin, would you demonstrate the voice that that you know the one I want you to do, please? <laughs> yeah, sure. Hello, WonderCon. It is so wonderful to see you all. I see several people in the audience with the springtime for Hitler look on their faces. They can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> And this is one of my favorite people to work with in the business, and when you hear some of the things this man has done, you will be very impressed. This is Mr. Neil Ross. <laughs> you create for us, if you can, I know this is tough for you, but a script. The opening of the show that you now do, that all these people watch. Really? Yes. You, well, all right, then let's do it. <laughs> Tonight, these three players are after big bucks, but they'll have to avoid the whammy as they play the most exciting game of their lives from Television City in Hollywood. Actually, it's in the Fairfax district. <laughs> it's time to press your luck. And now, here's the host of Press Your Luck and the director of the critically acclaimed motion picture, Cocaine Bear, <laughs> Elizabeth Banks! Hey. <laughs> then I go to my dressing room and they have to administer laudanum and oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> For years I've been telling people, if they want to get into cartoon voices, go to Neil's website, which is neilross.com, spelled like that. I paid a consultant a fortune to come up with that. Yes. <laughs> and listen to his demos there, because that's your competition if you get in. If you go to that site, you'll hear him announcing the Academy Awards, you'll hear him announcing the Emmy Awards, you'll hear him announcing the American Film Awards, you'll hear him doing promos for all your favorite shows, 
and all your favorite products. And we're going to now go back with the people to, to doing more of their voices here. This man was the voice of many characters on G.I. Joe and Transformers. And name some of the other shows they've heard you on. Oh, gosh. Uh... <laughs> Uh, 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 you mentioned G.I. Joe and Transformers as Voltron, uh, Spider-Man. I was the Green Goblin in Spider-Man, you may recall that. <laughs> and of course, uh, a wonderful, wonderful little show called Garfield. Oh, yes, yes. I must, I must mention that, and I'm, I'm, I'm spacing the other one. <laughs> well, you were Captain Planet. That's, well, uh, uh, yeah, all too briefly. That's a, uh, I, I think I am the only actor in Hollywood who has been replaced by both Tom Cruise and Mickey Rooney. <laughs> <laughs> swear to God, it's true, and I think it's a tribute to my versatility. <laughs> <laughs> I was Captain Planet for about 35 seconds. You were in the movie An American Tale? Yes, I was. I was, uh, I was Honest John. You remember him, the drunken Irish mouse? And, uh, we were just talking about that at my house today, how I played an entire scene with Madeline Kahn and never met her, <laughs> which I'm very unhappy about. I would love to have met her. Uh, another show that Neil worked out with me, he was O.G. Readmore, Captain O.G. Readmore oh, of the ABC oh, Weekend Specials. Oh, that's drawing crickets. <laughs> 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 You've been on so many other shows. We, we, we did a show, Neil and I did a show, which I mentioned this in a panel earlier today to see if anyone in the audience, on, on the, if you were at the, in this room at, for the animation writing panel, I did a show called Channel Up D3, oh, yeah. which was on uh, the CW network for about 11 seconds. <laughs> uh, and, and Neil was a regular on that. And we had on that show, um, one of the actors was a man named David Paver, who some of you may know remember the movie of Mr. Saturday Night and all those things. And I introduced Neil to David Paver. And I said, you two were both in the same movie. And they spent like 20 minutes figuring out which one it was. And it, tell them what it was that you guys were both So in. long ago, I forgot. It was, they were both in the movie, uh, the Robert Redford director called Quiz Show. Oh, for that. Yeah. And Neil did all the announcers. Yeah, I was always all the announcers, and he actually got to be a person. Um, <laughs> and um, I directed the Garfield, uh, the two shows, the Garfield and Fred show and the Garfield show for 20 some odd years between the two of them. And Neil was like our utility infielder. We brought him in. I got a role for a, 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 role for a guy, so I called Neil's agent, who is here somewhere. And, uh, uh, hello, that's Kathy over there. That's Neil's agent. Uh, and, uh, see, so your agent comes to the panel. That's, <laughs> that's my agent, too. Hey, Kathy. Hi, too. Hi, Kathy. Hi, the panels. <laughs> uh, Tell them some of the other places they've heard you, not necessarily in cartoons. One of the things we try to teach in some of these panels is that these people do not only do cartoons. Somebody out here, there's some dreams of doing cartoon voices. Well, the actual job is voiceover. And almost anybody who's successful at doing cartoon voices also does trailers, announce uh, audio books, uh, dubbing, looping. What are some of the other, other ways you've made money with your voice? Well, I've, 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 I've done one audio book, which was my book which is called Vocal Recall, The Life in Radio and Voiceovers. It's available on Amazon and Audible, and I, I did voice that book. And what a chore. I almost fired myself three times. Uh, but, uh, but God, you name it. I mean, I, did, did you make you audition for that book? Yes, yes, I beat out a, t a slew of other actors for that job. But, um, you know, uh, Mark is making a good point. A voiceover artist is not going to make movie star money, uh, far from it. And the people who are successful in this business generally tend to work a lot and work in, in more than one area. You may be doing animation, but you may be bringing some of those skills into doing uh, voiceovers in commercials. Uh, I've, done, I've done all kinds of things. I, I remember I was doing the, um, oh gosh, this, this exercise machine thing. Hmm. Total Gym. Total Jim, yeah, I did that forever. I, I, I can still remember it almost, you know, it's your Total Jim comes with a complete money back guarantee. Call now, it's one, and then I would have to plug in a phone number. Yeah, you convinced me to buy that. It's still in my garage. <laughs> you convinced me to buy that, and it's still in my garage. Yeah, well, so you're saying you don't use it. Do whatever Chuck Dor Norris does on it. 
I think. <laughs> anyway, every time I read that thing, I had to plug in a different phone number, and I would literally do hmm. hundreds of these. I would go into some kind of weird alpha state, and when it was over, I would say, what time is it? And it's like three hours had gone by, and I, to me, it felt like about 25 minutes. I was just... Hmm. So, it, it, the, yeah, the late, great Jack Angel used to refer to it as voiceatility, which was clever. The, the more you can do, the more different kinds of things you can do with your voice, the more likely you are to have a solid uh, career and, and be able to pay the rent, which is, you know, what we all aspire to. One day we were recording Garfields in the next studio. There was a wonderful actor who left us way too early named Joe Alasky. Some of you may know was the voice of Lucky Duck and a lot of Disney Warner Brothers characters. And he was recording the audio for a uh, GPS that would sound like Yosemite Sam. And he had to do 3,000 street names as Yosemite hmm. Sam. Wow. <laughs> you know, came out sounding like Harvey Firestein by the end of the session. So, uh, Kate, tell us what else you've done lately. Uh, lately, gosh. Well, I know, uh, when I first started doing voiceover, I did a lot of uh, theme park work for Disney parks around the world. So if you go on Small World out in Tokyo Disneyland, you'll hear, Welcome to It's a Small World. Please keep your hands and arms inside the boat at all times. And please, watch your children. She's very firm in Tokyo. They're very firm out there. <laughs> and then um, recently, two fun projects. I've do I'm doing a lot of looping now. So I was in Book of Boba Fett last year uh, as, <laughs> as our Tuscan Raiders. show called the I Am Groot short little shorts on yeah so in one episode he's taking a bath and he's playing with the moss and there's this squirrel bird I call it a squirt that just he's annoying the heck out of her and just No, there, there's a mini in every country, but I, I do do a lot of our work for Disneyland Paris and a lot mm. of the shows in Tokyo as well. They, they like to have both the original language of those theme parks and the American uh, voice as well. Hmm. They just kind of take, they take turns. So you'll hear French Mickey and then English Minnie and then French Daisy and then English uh, Chip and Dale. So it's a weird rotation. Okay. Hmm. Uh, Brian, where have we heard you lately? Uh, well, most recently, you've probably heard me uh, in Hotel Transylvania, Transformania. Uh, or we were talking about not anything. anything. Oh, anything. Okay. Uh, yeah, because I know we were kind of talking about that first. Uh, yeah, Hotel Transylvania, Transformania. Um, for reasons that were never disclosed to me, Adam Sandler didn't want to return for Dracula, so I guess they just needed to find someone who could cover, so there we go. Um, so yeah, I've gotten to do him for the film. There was a short film that was accompanying it, and then a video game that came out. And, uh, so I've gotten to be, I've been doing a lot of vampire work lately, which is good. Everyone told me it sucked, but it actually turned out to be a good thing. Uh, but uh, yeah, um, we were saying before, other work uh, besides just doing cartoon voices is um, a lot of times I'll get hired to do singing stuff specifically for commercials uh, hmm. because I have a singing background. So I've done everything from like operatic stuff to like a uh, drunk dude at a karaoke bar. Uh, <laughs> I do uh, caroler singing professionally. And I've done it for like McDonald's and uh, Walmart and a couple other places. And, yeah, you really, uh, like, like we were talking about, voice versatility, not even just what your voice can speak like, but singing can be a huge part of that as well. So, yeah. Brian, uh, first of all, if you like Brian, and you will really like him tremendously throughout this panel, um, he has some wonderful YouTube videos out there. Which, uh, uh, how many different videos have you got online right now? I think over 700, maybe. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. So take a week off from work. <laughs> Two weeks. Um, type in uh, Brian's name, and uh, you will be very entertained. Brian is also very expert at replicating the voices of classic characters, which we're going to make him do in a couple minutes. His <laughs> repertoire, because we're getting our money's worth out of this guy. That we're, not, we're not paying to be here. Uh, uh, Cynthia, tell us other places we, they've heard you. 
Oh, um, well, I am the voice of Gamora on What If. That's probably the most, uh, Gamora. Um, and as you were saying, I mean, I do a lot of other work. I also work a lot in video games. That's kind of where I got my start. Um, I'm Spartan Holly Tanaka in Halo 5. Um, I also am in Cyberpunk, which was a really cool game. Yeah, thank you, Cyberpunk fans. Uh, I was Tiba. Uh, I was the, the woman who knew where, where to take everybody through the walls. Um, our biggest game, I've been working on Starfield for about three years now. I'm super excited because it's finally coming out this year. Yeah, thank you, Starfield! Uh, and it was revealed at the E3 Games years ago. The artwork has been all over the internet. We're finally going to have that baby out. Um, I'm also Sin of the Destroyer in League of Legends. Uh, which is dope because she was the first black female challenger in the entire League of Legends world. Um, and also, I know! Thank you! I also am the narrator on video games, uh, particularly known for Valorant, which is crazy because that's a man's job typically. You know, they don't ever let the girls do stuff like kill shot! <laughs> cartoon on Disney Plus called Haley's On It. Um, it's a yeah! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> I'm Miss Jackson on this show when she's a teacher of the kids in the school. The lead uh, young lady, um, Haley, is Moana, the girl who plays Moana. She's fantastic. Um, and uh, I'm just really excited about the show. I actually work on that show with the creators, um, Devin Bungie and Nick Stanton. I got to work with them originally um, on a TV show called Prince of Peoria. So like you said, how we make our other money. I also am, I work on camera, in front of the camera, quite a bit. Um, and that sitcom was where I met the creators of that show. So what I love so much about what I do as a storyteller is I jump back and forth between the worlds of voiceover, video game, and in front of the camera um, really often. And I get to bounce a lot. So that's like, I remember when I first started, they told me I would actually never work in voiceover. Over. And now, uh, the, the big They were wrong. Ah, oh, they were wrong! <laughs> but it was like a one in a million chance I'd make it on TV, and that actually happened first, and then voiceover came later. So I'm really, really fortunate that I got to um, finally get a chance to break into the business as a VO artist. <laughs> in front of this audience, that finally makes you a legitimate actress. We don't care about it. I know! Trust me, I know. That's how I felt. I was like, no one gives a crap and I do TV. Somebody make me legitimate! <laughs> I was familiar with their first on camera, and uh, when I realized it was the same person who does other voices, I was mucho impressed. Hmm. Um, now, the person who claimed to be Joe down there, uh, what else, uh, where else have we heard you? It's not really me, it's my stunt double. Uh, I, I like Cynthia, I've been at this, uh, I blundered into voiceover from on camera. I was an on camera guy for many years. I was on Seinfeld and, and Will and Grace and, and, and Lois and Clark, and I was on tons of shows. Uh, I did a lot of that stuff, and then sort of tripped and fell into voiceover. Uh, and, and as we, as, as I know some of you already know, I'm the, I'm the current guy who, who does Jimmy Cricket. Uh, I'm the guy who does that right now. Uh, I, I just finished, I just uh, had a movie come out this year on Netflix called Chicken Hair and the Hamster of Darkness, which I think is the best name for a movie ever. And I played a famous little turtle, and he was kind of paranoid about everything that goes on around him, and it really is. And uh, what else? Uh, I am uh, Mayor Bourgeois in, in, in Miraculous Tales of Ladybug and Cat Noir. I'm the Chloe's father. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I've done a ton of video games too. We already talked about Red Dead Redemption. I've done uh, Fallout 4. I've done uh, lots of World of Warcraft. I played all I played all kinds of strange characters in World of Warcraft, from the monster characters to the very erudite characters to the very weird little characters. So I've done tons of that sort of stuff. I've done audio books. Uh, you can currently hear me uh, as uh, as a stake in the Albertsons new commercials where they talk. About <laughs> I am a stake, and what's funny about that is that you, and this is a, a I think Neil will meet, a, 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 agree with me on this, you never know. I started out, when I did the audition, it was supposed to be a very erudite, sort of classy stake. But when they ended up doing the commercial, it just sort of talks like me. So, <laughs> a lot of this stuff is going to work. And, and, and little secret thing that people don't know about me, I've also, besides on camera, besides all that stuff, I was also the, the cover boy for the first... Uh, uh, testing of baldness remedies in consumer reports. <laughs> and, uh, and I have a, a long career directing, and I'm a bit of an acting coach, and one of my clients was Dave Batista. 
Oh, wow. Hmm. Uh, which I coached him in the original auditions for Guardians. Hmm. Awesome. So, I got a weird career. <laughs> to tell us, uh, this is a traditional question we ask here, um, and we'll start with Neil. I want you to tell me the name of someone you were really impressed that you got to work with in a session. Name drop somebody that you just couldn't believe. Oh, well. The next microphone. Back when we used to have next microphones. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I guess meeting uh, and working for Warren Beatty was a big experience oh, for me hmm. on uh, Dick Tracy. Yeah, I, I'm briefly visible in the movie as the green newsman. I'm on screen long enough for my wife to say, Oh, honey, I th <laughs> <laughs> And then, I, as, as Mark mentioned, I, I did uh, a quiz show, and the director was Robert Redford. Wow. Hmm. And most of the time you do these things and a sound editor shows up. You know, I've worked for Steven Spielberg innumerable times. I only met him once at a, at a gathering, you know. He's, but uh, I pour, peered through the porthole and stupidly said to the woman who was assisting me, oh, that, that guy looks like Robert Redford. She said, well, that's because that's Robert Redford. <laughs> and, uh, I said, oh, uh, uh, well, how do I address him? And she said, well, try Bob. He, that's what most, <laughs> most of us call him. And uh, so in I went, so that was, that was fun. And then one, one time I worked with an older gentleman and you know, it was an unremarkable session. And, uh, when I came out, Alan Oppenheimer, who's another great voiceover person, grabbed me and said, do you realize you got to work with George Hearn? And I said, who's George Hearn when he's at home? Well, of course, he's one of the biggest Broadway guys. You could probably George him. Hearn was the main uh, Sweeney Todd. Yeah. Oh, Broadway, wow. And he was the original Albin in La Caja Foal. And he was, um, he was in uh, the original 1776. He's a great, great voice over And he actually did an episode of Garfield, friends. I wrote a musical, which he played with a cat called The Man Who Hated Cats. And, uh, he loved doing a cartoon. He just loved it. And one more before I outstay my welcome. It was, it, was, it, was, it was wonderful to walk into a studio and do an episode of The Jetsons uh, with... Um, oh, God. I'm, Mel Blanc. No, not Mel Blanc. Uh, Dawes, oh, Dawes, 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 Dawes Butler, Dawes who was just an immortal in the business. Hmm. That, that was a big day for me. If you don't know who Dawes Butler was, you have no business being a fan of cartoon voice. No. <laughs> Not only, but Dawes Butler was the voice of Huckleberry Hound, Yogi Bear, Mr. Jenks, uh, Snagglepuss, Quick Draw McGraw, Baba Louie, Snooper, Blabber, Augie Doggie, Elroy Jetson, Captain Crunch, Hokey Wolf, and about 800 others. And he was the nicest man in the world. And a lot of people who are now voiceover actors studied with him. He was the most wonderful teacher, and, uh, and any one of them will punch you out if you say a bad word about Dawes Butler. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, wasn't Mel Blanc in the session, too? No, I never met Mel Blanc. In those days, he'd had a terrible car accident, yeah. and he worked from a studio that I believe his son set up for him. Okay. And so he didn't come in for anything. So. I, I directed Mel Blanc once for a cartoon oh. project, and the opening line was, What's up, Doc? He was doing Bugs Bunny. Huh. And I gave him a copy and I said, you need some rehearsal time on that? <laughs> <laughs> he said, I think I can hack it. <laughs> and he was a wonderful man. Um, uh, Kate, who have you worked with? Rare is the ensemble record these days, but I did um, ensemble recording for about like 10 episodes of Thundercats Roar, Ooh. which I had so much fun on. It was oh. such a wild time. We had so much fun in the booth. And my favorite episode was my first one, where I was Gwen the Unicorn, who was supposed to be like uh, the last unicorn. What was her name? Um, Mia Farrow, yes. So, <laughs> and uh, we recorded that episode and Dana Snyder was in the booth with me. And I'm a huge Dana Snyder fan because he was Master Shake on Aqua Teen Hunger Force. He's the alchemist on Venture Brothers, and he was just so delightful. And then the one that happened recently, I'm doing a new Cartoon Network show, and I went in right after Keith David. So I got to breathe his air, and I believe that helped me to be better. And he just. It was real quick, like I saw the back of him leave. So, uh, you don't get that close to heaven without stealing a bit of a cloud. <laughs> <laughs> it, uh, it used to 
used to be in the old days that most shows recorded ensemble, the term that KJ yeah. used. And then we, we got all the actors at the same time in the same room at different microphones. Mm -hmm. We'd do some read-throughs, we'd go over it. And there was a wonderful feeling of camaraderie and of actors helping each other. Uh, we would have I did sessions with Neil and Frank Welker. And Frank would suggest something to Neil, and Neil would suggest something to Frank, and then they'd switch roles and things like that. And everybody's goal was to make everybody else in the room laugh and blow their lines, and we have to do it on the tape. Sometimes we'd switch clothing, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Neil was in, we had Gary Owens in doing, you all remember Gary Owens. All that Gary was here to say when I was here. So much funnier. So, so we had Neil there and Frank Welker and Greg Berger and, and Gary, and for some reason we decided to do a um, Gary Owens sound alike contest. Hmm. <laughs> we had a time to kill, and we got someone from the next room, the next recording, to come over and be the judge. And, and without seeing who was talking, each one of them read some copy. And I think Gary came in third. He came in first to make his Gary Owens impression. It was. It was. Uh, we did. We did a lot of strange things like that. Um, Brian, have you worked at Ensemble at all since you were new in the business? Unfortunately, no. I've never had the privilege of being able to do an ensemble thing. However, um, on Hotel Transylvania, the director, one of the directors of the film, Derek Dryman, I did not realize this while we were working together the whole time, and I only figured it out like a month after we finished recording. Um, I was going back to watch some SpongeBob clips for an upcoming video that I was doing, and I just kept seeing his name pop up on all of the original SpongeBob's. I'm like, wait, what? And he was like one of the main story guys on the original uh, season of SpongeBob, and I was like, I didn't realize I was working with meme legends. <laughs> while I was making the head show. <laughs> Brian, do you have a voiceover hero? Uh, I do. Yeah, I do have a voiceover hero. Uh, the first voice actor that I really um, learned about and really uh, took inspiration from was Jim Cummings. Mm -hmm. I, that, <laughs> he's awesome. Um, yeah, I remember when I first found out, I think I was like eight or nine, that I was like, the same guy who was Balto, who was Steel in Balto, is Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> I, my, my brain could not put that together. And so I started looking, I'm like, what else has this guy done? And then I was just like, wait, he's also Tigger, and he's also Pete, and he's also like half the cartoon characters you've ever heard in the 90s, and Darkwing Duck, and that's when I was like, oh, people do this for a living? <laughs> Cynthia, who have you worked with in voiceover that you were impressed with? Um, I did this series for Netflix called Army of the Dead Lost Vegas. Oh, yeah. And, um, yeah, and, speaking of Batista. Yeah, speaking of Batista. Um, <laughs> That's the sequel, right? Or the prequel? The I think it was the sequel. Um, and this was with, directed by Zack Snyder. And oh. I just remember, and unfortunately, we were like we said, in our own houses, you know, in our, you know, booths or whatever, and I was on the Zoom, but I just thought, like, someone else would come out, and then it was just like, Zack Snyder was there, <laughs> and I was like, get the what? <laughs> 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 uh, so that was really freaking cool, but honestly, there's this other Netflix project, but I actually don't know if I can say too much about it, but it's a, it's a spinoff of The Witcher. Um, and it's an animated series, obviously. Um, I don't know if I can talk about the character that I do, but the point is, that job was actually the most impressive um, experience for me. I was impressed in the sense that it, the director was from Tokyo, and um, I'm not even going to pretend to get his name right, <laughs> um, but I was fascinated with the way he was able to direct me, not speaking my language, speaking his own language, and not using really um, any uh, interpreter. He would give me notes. I don't even know how to explain it. I'll never be able to translate what that experience was like for me. But he told me what he wanted, and I understood. Because he spoke to me about tone and, and feeling in a language I did not know, but in a way I could understand. And that was the most impressive experience I've ever had in VO. Because I realized that what we're communicating when we're telling these stories, it does not matter. Like whether it is the silliness and the, you know, of Bugs Bunny, you know, um, or the suspense in video games, you know, it, it just doesn't matter. Or the joy of like just, you know, all those great classic cartoons and your Yogi Bears and your whatever. I just thought, man, we translate life, you know? I just thought it was so freaking cool, and that was the best experience I've ever had in VO, like, by far. <laughs> <laughs> Joe? 
That, that's such a cool story. Uh, uh, Mark, this first one is for you, because I, I know that you'll get the reference. I, when I first started uh, doing all of this stuff, and it was about 40 years ago, I worked in a, a little radio rep group back in Connecticut that was made up of actors from a group uh, of professional actors and, and producers and directors. The guy who directed the original production of The Music Man was involved in it. Fred Hellerman of The Weavers, which was this big folk band in the 60s, was in this group. Ina Ballin, who was a star, who was, who was the leading lady in The Patsy with Jerry Lewis. I mean, there was some really classic people in that. So that was my first touch of going into a studio with people that I just went and looked at and went, oh my god. Uh, out here, the first one was Phil Proctor. Phil Proctor is such a spectacular voiceover guy, and I grew up as a kid with the Fire Sign Theater. Come on in out of the cornstalk, you dry your mucklocks by the fire. And you know, I was a big, uh, a big Fire Sign Theater person, so Phil was the one that out here that really did it for me. Great. Now we're going to share what these people do. We're going to do a reading of uh, a script that they have never seen. It is a very boring fairy tale. I picked a boring one intentionally. And they are allowed to do anything they want to the dialogue. We don't usually let them do this in a real recording session. But this is not a real recording session. We're going to be doing the story of Rapunzel. All right. Forgive me while I direct. All right. Start passing scripts down. We all have pencils to mark with. To be directed by Mark Evan. This is so exciting. You <laughs> see the way I direct, which is just use that microphone. Thank you. Uh, okay. <laughs> I'm going to assign the roles. Joe, yes. you are playing multiple roles. You are playing the prince, you are playing peasant number two, and you are playing the servant. Got it. All right? Cynthia, congratulations, you are Rapunzel. Oh! <laughs> I am more the narrator, and we're going to make you do, you know what I'm going to make you do here? I want a different classic cartoon voice for every line the narrator <laughs> Well, that'll be easy. <laughs> and Dame Gothel. Dame Gothel is the witch. Yeah! yeah. Right. Now, Neil, you are going to play peasant number one. I'm giving you notes here with all the names. Peasant number one. The valet, the king, Henry, and the priest. As I told you about utility and field. I believe the priest sounds like James Mason. Okay. Do you know one of the you did for Marvin the Martian? No? I think a little bit. Okay. <laughs> do whatever you want for the other ones. And now I'm going to give them a moment or two to mark their scripts, and I'm going to do my public service announcement, which I always do. Just a quick question, show of hands. Does anybody remember James Mason? Oh, good, okay. <laughs> These people love people with interesting voices, right? right? Um, now, um, we have a lot of people here who probably want to get into this business who are imagining making the transition to Kate and some other, some other Brian and some other people have made from watching the panel to being on the panel. I always want to caution beginning voice actors to watch out for predatory voice coaches in schools. There are some wonderful ones out there. There are people who are brilliant at teaching. One of the things that sets apart the good teachers from the bad teachers is the good teachers will say, you're not ready yet for me, you're not ready yet to make a demo, I'm not going to take your money. Mm -hmm. The bad teachers will take your money and, and promise you that within 20 minutes you will have, you will have more work than Tom Kenny. <laughs> but, and, and, and it is actually heartbreaking, I've had people come to me, I had a woman come to me once who had spent $8,000 on voice lessons for her daughter. Mm. And this was $8,000 she could ill afford, wanting her daughter to have a career. And, I, and she sent me her daughter's demo, and her, someone should have told this girl, you know, no, you're not, this is not for you. I know you want to do it, that doesn't mean you can't do it. Uh, most of the good voice coaches these days are people who are also working voice actors like Bill Farmer, and uh, uh, help me with some other names of people who are teaching these days. Uh, Mick Winger. Yes, Mick Winger. Um, there's a lot of people who do this. Anyway. Bob Bergen. Bob Bergen. Bob Bergen, Bob Bergen yeah. is a wonderful teacher. Bob Bergen posts tips on voice acting on Instagram. Go to hmm. Instagram and listen to every Bob Bergen video on there, and you will learn something. All right, we don't have a lot of time left here, so we're not going to let you mark the whole script. Um, ready? I would like to start here. Um, keep in mind, they have never seen this script before, um, and they're going to do whatever they want. And you can change voices anytime you feel like, also, i tell you that. Could we start, please, with Mr. Hull in this role as the narrator, the story of Rapunzel. 
Oh God, this is what we're going to do, party people. All right, King Julian in the house saying once upon a time, there was a house with the most beautiful garden anyone had ever seen. It was like so green, you guys. Like, you can't even believe I had to tell Maurice and he didn't believe me. Uh, peasants would gather around to admire it, just like my peasants admire me. And especially to ask about one special plant. What is that beautiful flower that grows within that garden? Well, first, I gotta tell you, I really admire the narrator. But I also have to tell you, it's called Rampion, and it grows nowhere else for thousands of miles around. I must get some. It looks absolutely delicious. <laughs> you don't want to go in there. That's the garden of Dame Garthel. She's a wicked witch. She'll cast a spell on anyone who dares touch her Rampion. <laughs> Your hands off my rampion or else! Um, everyone stayed very far away from the <laughs> Everyone except a woman who lived nearby with a husband who had a pot of honey. <laughs> oh, MG Henry, I have an overwhelming desire for a salad made from that plant. <laughs> but as an evil witch, and shouldn't we focus on having that child we've wanted for so long? Keep your hands to yourself. <laughs> and did I stutter? If I do not eat rampion, I will surely die. <sighs> Well, oh, my dear, if you want it, you will have it. Yes, I will. <laughs> oh, it's a Sir Henry climbed the wall into Dame Garthel's garden and began picking Rampion, which is, which is badness. This has a badness lover. You can't do that. <laughs> that was when the witch appeared. You! How dare you come into my garden and steal my rampion? I will turn you into a disgusting creature, the lowest form of life! Oh, please forgive me. My wife craves rampion so badly. She will die if she doesn't have some to eat. Oh, boo! <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'll tell you what, Shelly boy, I will let you take as much rampion as you want on one condition. You must give me the child which your wife will bring into the world. I shall care for it like its natural mother. I simply can't do that. You can, you coward. Then prepare to become a warthog. Oh, I beg of you not to do that. I promise the child will be yours. <laughs> don't know how much I have to keep telling you. Just give me the child! So the deal was made, and the wife got her rampion. Months later, the couple finally did have a beautiful child who they named Daffy. <laughs> Shall we name her? As I have established, <laughs> we shall name her Daffy Short for Rapunzel. Or <laughs> 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 well, since she is mine, I shall name her. What a coincidence! I shall also call her Rapunzel. <laughs> Three hands think alike, don't we? They. Goodbye. <laughs> Who went with that? The witch took the child and departed like a rascally rabbit. Cry the well. Yeah, boo-hoo. In the years that followed, little Ponzel grew into a beautiful young woman. She would sing as she brushed her hair long and golden. <laughs> <laughs> she sings happily. <laughs> 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 
but I don't sing. <laughs> I think you have to sing. Do you want me to dub for you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Cynthia, you move your lips and Kate will sing. <laughs> System top down AC with the cooling system. When you come up in the club, it is blazing up like stacks on deck, like a saving <laughs> Dead gun, how do I follow that? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 